prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Amen. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit.
Good evening, everyone. Today is uh, definitely a, a time to reflect and and to just be in awe of God's goodness. More than two thousand years ago, you know that this Friday was the day that He went through so much injustice and so much pain and suffering for you and I. And my prayer is that this evening that the Holy Spirit will take us back to just be reminded of how much God loved us loves us. And I know there's some of us who've been in the faith for many, many years and sometimes that message can just be a common thing because we hear it all the time. But my prayer that it will continue to be a fresh reminder of God's amazing love for us that we will never grow cold just as God's love never grows cold on us. Amen? Amen. His God remains a flame towards us. And my prayer is that even as the years go, the more in love we are with Jesus and the more we are on fire for Jesus for all that he's done for us because there's nothing that we can ever give back for what God has done for us we can just give us a small token of offering of our worship and of our praise and, and our being to Jesus and just my prayer is that that his spirit will just take us and bring us back to what Jesus went through because I know that there's many of us, we, we get touched when we see the news or we see other people suffering injustice and, and experiencing, you know, torture and all the, the, the pain that they go through. But my prayer is that the, the message of Jesus, what Jesus went through, shall be the main fuel or the main thing that just grows inside of us that wants all of us to want to share the gospel, to, for us to want to live for Jesus and want to declare who Jesus is because what he's gone through is nothing compared. What he's gone through is nothing compared. And I know there's so many people have gone through so much in life, but nothing compares to what Jesus has gone through in the face of this world. Amen? Amen. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will take us back to be reminded of his amazing love. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you, Jesus, for this moment, for this very time that you brought us together here, Jesus. Because I know, God, you want us, you want to encounter us with your presence. You want to encounter us with your 
love and through your word and through your worship and through the music of Jesus. And even through the fellowship where he said, when, when two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in their midst. So I thank you, Jesus, that you are in our midst. And I know, Lord, there's some people who came here seeking healing, seeking deliverance, seeking freedom, seeking your presence, seeking love. And I pray, Jesus, that tonight will be the night that they will encounter your amazing love, your transforming love, your unconditional love. I pray, Jesus, that you use me as your mouthpiece to declare your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you give me words of wisdom and knowledge and guidance, God, as I share your word. Lord, just use this moment, God, to do and to have your way. We are just your vessels, Jesus. And we are just here to ready to serve, ready to just share what you have done for us. Take us back, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we know the title of our message is Good Friday. And we know that when you look at Good Friday, you might say, like, why is it called Good Friday? Nothing good happened to Jesus. But why is it called Good Friday? The thing is, everything that Jesus has gone through was not good at all. Everything that was said about him, towards him, done to him, was nothing good at all. However, him not receiving the goodness gave us the goodness of God. That's why all of us here can attest that God is great and God is good. But none of us can stand here and say what Jesus has gone through is so good. No, it wasn't. He didn't deserve to be beaten, to be whipped, to be mocked, to be tortured, to be crucified. Yet we call it Good Friday because his goodness was poured upon us. His goodness and grace was poured upon us. We should have been the ones who were suffering and being beaten, whipped, being tortured for the sins that we committed. Because none of us can stand and say that I'm righteous. No one can say I'm perfect. That's why Jesus himself had to come to this dark, evil world to save us, to redeem us, to make us new people. Amen? And that's by his love, and that's why we call it Good Friday, because it's God's goodness that was represented towards us. Amen? It was never him, you know, it's never us being good to God, but it's his goodness displayed on the cross for us, humanity, to let us know how much we are loved. And today I'm gonna to be showing some images that it's probably not gonna be easy to look at. But I truly believe six, more than 16 years ago, this movie called Passion of the Christ was the best, to me, description of what Jesus went through. Because he went through so much and we need to see it visually for so much because I'm a visual person. And just, and I'll also allow his spirit to just remind us, man, look how much Jesus loves you. Look how much he has done and gone through to save you and I. And my prayer is that God will take you back and just be immersed in his love and grace. As we look at this scene, we see Jesus who was innocent. All he did was claim that he was the son of God. All he did was heal people, do good to people. And yet they chained him up. He chained, they chained him up. And they wanted to compare him to a man named Barabbas, who was a murderer, who was a notorious man, who's done many evil things. And we hear people screaming, yelling, you know, let release Barabbas, release Barabbas. Let Jesus be crucified. And we know for a fact that he didn't deserve to be chained up. He didn't deserve to be chained up. And there's a lot of people who are chained up right now in depression and anger, in bitterness and hatred. There's a lot of people who are chained up in the past hurts and pain and stuff that was done or said to them. And Jesus was in, was in prison so that you and I can be released, so that you and I can be free, so those chains can, be, can fall down. And we no longer have to be angry and depressed. We don't have to be a people who is bitter at life and bitter towards God and bitter about everything. But we are able to be free because of what Jesus has done for us. It says in Matthew 27, 15 to 18, now at the feast, the governors were accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas, son of Abba. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, 
whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus who's called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. As we look at verse 15, now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release from the crowd anyone prisoner whom they wanted. Like I mentioned, Jesus is the one who should have been released because he was innocent. Instead, Jesus, instead of Barabbas, was the one released. And this is a, a beautiful depiction and description of what God did for us. Because technically all of us should have been in prison and hell for what we've done and tortured eternally for what we've done. But instead, Jesus took our place so that you and I could be released from hell, released from condemnation, released from humiliation because of his love for us. And in verse 16, and they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And what's interesting, his name means son of Abba. He was still a child of God. Like you and I, we were sinners. Like you and I, we have done wrong, and yet God still loves us. And that's what astonished me when I found out the message of Jesus. Because I grew up a, grew a, a kid forcefully, you know, to go to church by my mom. I was forcefully, you know, going to church, even brought to go to church. But this message didn't really hit me. I thought church was for people who were perfect, who have their lives all together. Because you see them, they're dressed up really well. They have a smile on their face. They look like they have good, perfect lives. I didn't know that. I didn't know that Jesus came for us who are broken, who are lost, who are seeking truth. And I am like Barabbas. I've done many wrong, but yet Jesus loved me. And he loved you so much. And this is so awesome that you can be his child. You don't have to be stuck in your shame and your guilt because there's some people like, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to serve God. I, I'm not a perfect person. I've done so many wrong. I'm here to let you know that God has called you and he loves you and he wants to free you and forgive you. And he just said, he said, my child, come as you are. Because there's so many people like, no, let me get myself straight. Let me clean myself up. Then I'll go to church. Then I'll serve God. But the truth of the matter, Jesus is saying, come as you are, I am the one who will clean you up. I will give you a new heart, a new mind. I will give you a new identity. And that's what God is trying to say to us. You don't have to be ashamed. He will love you. He called out and reached out to the prostitutes, the drunkards, it's not, and the lepers. He reached out to the outcasts. And a lot of it is you and I. We're not here, that's why I, I praise God I don't have to wear a robe because you know, during those days, they had these robes, they looked so holy and pure, even Jesus rebuked them. You know, because they may appear holy from the outside, but deep in their hearts they're full of, you know, full of self-righteousness. Full of hatred, full of bitterness, full of judgment, condemnation. And that doesn't represent the Lord whatsoever. Amen? Amen. And my prayer is that when people see us, they don't see us as perfect people. I'm not. I'm far from it. But they see people who, who God loves so much that he was able to heal, restore, and make new. Amen? Amen? And that's you and I, and what that's what God did for you and I. Verse 17, so when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that was out of envy that they had delivered him. In continuation, now the chief priests and the elders persu persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to him, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Barabbas is you and I. We were released. We should have been the one in prison to be tortured, to be whipped, to be mocked, to be beaten repeatedly, to be crucified. And yet Jesus says, no, Barabbas, I will take your place. I will take your place. So what's the number one point this evening? Jesus was in prison so that we can be released from our sins, bad habits, addictions, depression, anger, low self-image, and hopelessness. Amen? Amen? Read it with me. Jesus was in prison so that we can be released from our sins, bad habits, addictions, depression, anger, low self-image, and hopelessness. Amen? That's what Jesus did. He was in prison 
so that you can actually be free from our sins. We don't need to be enslaved to our sins anymore. Jesus is able to deliver us and set us free. Amen? So even if you have things that you're going through, lay it before the feet of Jesus. And he alone will help you overcome those sins. Because I had sin issues in the past where I just kept doing over and over. I said, Lord, can I ever be free? And Jesus said, yes, because you have the righteousness of God. Remember, my child, my righteousness will change you. My Holy Spirit will change you and mold you to my image. Don't look at yourself. You're supposed to look at Jesus. Amen? When you look at yourself, you will see sin. But when you look to Jesus, you see grace. You see forgiveness. And that's what God wants us to do. Don't look to yourself for righteousness. Look upon Christ. Look upon Christ because he alone makes us righteous. Amen? And that's why Jesus came because none of us can perfect ourselves. That's why Jesus came. And if you have addictions, God can set you free, I tell you. You know, um, I have a brother of mine who was uh, had an addiction for many, many years. And this is a hard drug to overcome. But through the grace and power of Jesus Christ, after seven years, it took a while. But God was able to deliver him from his addiction. Amen? Amen. And God can do the same with us. So don't ever lose hope. Even if you falter and make mistakes, God's grace is there. His grace doesn't give you the license to do whatever you want. His grace empowers you to change, empowers you to do right. Amen? That's what his grace is for. So don't ever think that you have to do it yourself by your power. Jesus is just asking, humble yourself, my child. Lay it down. Trust in me, and I will help you. That's all he's asking. Humble yourself and let his power move within you. And there's some of you dealing with depression, especially these days during the pandemic. A lot of people struggle with depression. A lot of people committed suicide this year and even last year. A high rate of suicide, a high rate of depression. But I'm here to let you know that Jesus can free you from that depression, amen? That you don't have to be enslaved by depression. Jesus can help you through it. And I want all of you to be reminded that whatever you're going through, remember, it's just a season. It's not forever. And I know it seems like it's forever because you're not seeing things change or go the way you want it to be. But I want you all to be encouraged and be reminded that in God's time, it will shift for you. Amen? Amen. That that season that you're experiencing, that depression, that sadness, is just a moment. And it's a temporary thing. But however, God's using it to build you up, to build your faith, and to make you see that God is there with you in the midst of depression. Amen? Amen. He will carry you through. He will help you. So I encourage you, don't lose hope. Don't give up. God is there with you, and he will carry you through. And there's some people who are just so angry. They're angry about everything that's happening in the world, with politics, with all the things that's happening, the injustice. A lot of people are angry inside. My prayer is that you will just give it all to Jesus. God doesn't want us to be angry people. The only anger that is good is righteous anger. That we're angry for things that needs to get done for his name. Amen? Not anger in terms of causing division and hatred and resentment and people killing one another and harming one another. But the anger is that, wow, there's a lot of people who need help, who are poor, who are, who are broken. That's the type of anger that God is looking for. And slow self-image. There's a lot of people who don't, who are not standing with their head held high. A lot of people are just looking down at themselves and they're depressed and they have this low self-image which keeps them away from achieving their vision from God. But I'm here to encourage you to let you know that your image is found in Jesus. Amen? Amen. That you are not are made in the image of God. So don't ever identify yourself based on what people said to you or done to you. You're made in the image of God. And once you understand that and live by it, you will be released from the chain of the past. Because there's so many people who are chained up from what has happened, the traumatic moments that happen in your life, from the things that were done and said to you. But God wants to set you free and let you know that, hey, I'm going to use you for my glory. I'm going to use you to do greater things for my name. Amen? So my prayer is that you will keep your head up high and say, yes, I am a child of God. I can do all things through Christ and give me strength. Amen? You are more than able. And God can also release you from hopelessness. There's always hope in Christ. There's always hope in Christ. That's why when things get rough, I put my hope in Christ. 
And I know that God's going to carry me through and carry me through. Without hope, yes, it's a, you will be depressed. Without hope, you will commit suicide. Without hope, you would be angry and bitter. But if you have the hope in Christ within you, ah, it just fills you with so much peace that God is in control. Amen? Amen. So we see here, this is the scene where they were just trying to crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. Storoporo. Storoporo. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Storoporo. In the Greek, it means to, to, to be put to death. To put to death. And here, you see, it also means it's the, the Roman way of crucifying people on the cross. That's why we know that Jesus died on the cross. Amen? He died on the cross. He was crucified. And Jesus wants to put to death things in your life that are not good for you. Because there's so many things that you're carrying. And Jesus is saying, I want to put that to death. I don't want you to hold on to those things. But I want you to nail those things on the cross. Because Jesus carried it all. Amen? He carried it all on the cross. So Jesus crucified our sins. He crucified our traumatic moments that we went through, and especially every pain and hurt caused by others. I feel in my spirit, there's some of you who's been hurt by someone in the past and you're still carrying it today. How do I know you're carrying it today? You, 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 so you have so much anger that you're dealing with. You're not at peace. You're always troubled. It's always replayed over in your mind, time after time, especially when you're alone. That's how you know you're still carrying that hurt. And Jesus is telling you today, forgive that person. Let go. I know they've done you wrong, and you don't deserve what you went through. But I want to heal you, my child. I want to set you free. Because forgiveness releases you. Always remember that. When you don't forgive, you are put in a prison. But God wants to release you from that prison. Amen? And every time you try to hold that bitterness, that hatred and resentment, you are the one suffering, not them. You might say, they don't deserve my forgiveness and all that. Remember, Jesus has forgiven you. We didn't deserve his forgiveness, yet he has forgiven us. We were enemies of God, and yet he has forgiven us. And God say, forgive them, because what you went through may not be good, and I don't like what you went through, my child. However, I'm going to use what you've gone through to help many people out there who need to hear the message of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Joseph didn't deserve to be betrayed by his brothers. He didn't deserve to be sold. He didn't deserve to go through what he went through, but yet God used it to move him to the destiny he planned for him. If it weren't for him being sold, he wouldn't be in Egypt. And if, if Potiphar or his wife didn't accuse him of rape, which he didn't do, he wouldn't be in prison where he met the officials who were connected to Pharaoh. And by that, he was able to interpret those dreams. And by that, he was able to help millions of people from the famine and be second in power. Not only that, he helped his family who betrayed him, who have done him wrong. You see, God will use every pain and hurt, everything that you've gone through for a greater purpose. It may not make sense at the moment, but I want you to trust in him. I want you to put your faith in him that he's going to use it for a greater good, even in the moment I don't see it. I'm going to trust that God's going to use whatever I've gone through for a greater good. Amen? Amen. Jesus was wet. He was wet. He was wet. So much blood was spattering. His skin was taken off his back. They went through so many times. And there's some of you who live you've done you wrong. God understands what you've gone through. And he's there for you. And not only does he want to heal you emotionally, but he also wants to heal you physically. It says in Matthew 27, 25 to 26, and all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. 
Isaiah 53, 17. So that he fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He himself took our infirmities upon himself and carried away our diseases. Amen? And it says Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crucified for our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The punishment required for our well-being fell upon him. And by his wounds, by his stripes, we are healed. Amen? Amen? And I truly believe in my spirit, I felt I needed to declare this. There's some of you going, going through health issues. There's some of you going through health issues, and you're seeking for God's healing. And, and it could be today. Amen? It could be tonight. It's up to the Lord. You see, we trust in him. We don't know, but we have to believe in it. Amen? There, there's some people who don't even believe in it at all. But God is evil, and I've seen it. And you all know what happened to my mom. I don't need to share the story. I always repeat it over and over. But he was able to perform a miracle in her life. And I know she's watching. I asked her if she wanted to come tonight, but she's not ready. You know, um, but you know, in due season, she'll be ready to come to church again. But um, yes, yeah, she went through so much, and it seemed impossible. Even the chaplain and the doctor said, just give up. There's no hope. They're like, no, my trust is not in you or even the chaplain. My trust is in Jesus Christ. And when I put my trust in Jesus Christ, he was able to perform a miracle that blew everyone away. Because she bled so much. They said, you know what, just give up. There's no one who bled as much as she had in, this, in the history of this hospital. That's what we said. But they were able to stop it through the grace of God. And now she's alive. So you, I know there's some of you tonight or knows a loved one who's going through health issues or some of your family members. And I, I'm, I'm praying pray and declaring that his healing presence shall meet you. Amen? Shall meet you. The third is this. Jesus was whipped so that we can be emotionally and physically healed and restored. Amen? Jesus was whipped so we can be emotionally and physically healed and restored. And here's the tough one. We see here that soldiers gather these thorns that they put together. And they put it on Jesus' head. And you would think that would be enough. No. They grab their sticks and beat it upon his head, which was which is being sucked in to his skull. <sighs> then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head. Jesus wore the crown of thorns so that we can be cleansed from a guilty conscience. Amen? And receive a new mindset about ourselves, about people, about life, and about God. Amen? Jesus wore the crown of thorns so that we can be cleansed from a guilty conscience. Because there's so many of you, you're stuck in your guilt. Even though you've done it so long ago, you're still carrying that guilt and shame. And God is saying, I want to set you free, my child. I don't want you to linger in replaying those things that you've done wrong. I have forgiven you. As far as the east is from the west, I will remember your sins no more. You know that? Jesus doesn't remember it, so stop remembering your sins. Jesus is ready for God in your sins when you ask for his forgiveness. Amen? So don't replay. You don't have to be in guilt and live in shame. That is the way of the enemy. Always remember that. Guilt and shame is from the enemy, not of God. Because his spirit will always lead you back to the Lord. The enemy will always tell you all these lies. Say you're not good enough, you're bad, you're evil, you shouldn't even step in the church. That's of the devil. The spirit of God will always lead you back to the Lord. You say, my child, I know you made that mistake, but I have forgiven you. I will help you. Get back up. I'm the God of the second, third, fourth, fifth chances. Amen? Amen. <laughs> And, the, and also to give you a new mind, especially about yourself. I tell you guys, I had a negative view, view point about myself. Because people said things to me, I've done things. I had this negative view of myself growing up. I, I'm totally different the way you see me now. I, I'm not this person who I am now in terms of being able to speak out and being bold and all that stuff. That all came from the Spirit of God. I was a shy person. But when I received the Spirit of God, 
He gave me the boldness to share the gospel, to preach his word, to teach the word, his word in Alhambra. I spent most of my ministry time in Alhambra high schools and, you know, the whole of San Diego area. That's been my area for many years, and God brought me here now to Eagle Rock. So I know God has greater things in store for, for me and for just his kingdom because I, I have a heart and passion to help people know their identity. Because so many people don't know their identity. They're lost. They're confused. They're like, I want to be like so-and-so. I want to be like this person. No. God has uniquely made you to be you. Amen? There's no one like you. Amen? In this world. So you don't need to compare yourself. You don't need to look down on yourself. God wants you to keep getting better at yourself. Amen? God wants you to keep improving yourself. Not to be like anyone else. But to be the best version of yourself. Amen? So you can have a new mindset about yourself. You can have a new mindset about people. I used to not care about people whatsoever. I had no compassion before Christ. But now when I see injustice, when I see people going through hardships, I want to help them. And that's why I believe God made me a chaplain as well. That's my regular job I have. And I'm able to help families, help children deal with death and deal with, you know, things that are hard to deal with in life. And I've seen so many things that is hard for a kid to, to see and go through. But I, I feel so blessed to be able to help them, to let them find Jesus and help also live out their calling and purpose. I remember just a few months ago, you know, this, these two twins, they were doing so bad in school because of their father was hospitalized and it was hard for them. So their grades just, you know, came crashing down. But I praise God, I was, help, I was able to help them know Christ and know their identity. And in the next few weeks, they started to improve their grades, even though their father was declining. And that just gave me, I, I felt so much joy in that. Because I see that they are living out their purpose. They're not letting whatever happened to them to stop them. Amen? They're going to go, they're going to keep moving forward and keep pursuing what God designed for them. And that's my prayer that you will also have with God. God will also change your mindset about him. He will give you a new mindset. And here, not only was a crown of thorns was upon his head, but also they were mocking him. They were despising him. They were beating him up. They were just treating him so wrong. It says here, and they put a reed on his right hand and kneeling before him, they took, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. They took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. All of us, like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one his own way. But the Lord has caused the wickedness of his of us all, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing to fall on him instead of us. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth to complain or defend himself like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before her shearers. So he didn't open his mouth. He had every right to open his mouth. And, and tell all those people that he could have told everyone their sins. He could have easily, you know, stood up for himself and called the angels of God and just destroy all these people. But he allowed himself to be oppressed. He allowed himself to go through injustice and mockery and pain for you and I. So we don't have to be mocked by the demons and say, hey, let's let these people suffer hell for what they've done. Because all the demons and the devil, all they want is to rejoice for you, for you and I to go to hell. For you and I to go to hell. They want that. They want to mock us and be reminded of what we've done. But Jesus said, I'll take the mocking. I'll take the injustice. I'll take the pain. I will take all the beating so that my children will be with me in paradise. Amen? Amen. So that my children will be in heaven. Jesus remained silent because he knew that there was a greater purpose ahead. He was willing to take the beating, willing to take the justice, so you and I can be free, so you and I can go to heaven. Jesus was humiliated and condemned so that we can boldly stand before God. Do you know that? You and I can stand boldly. I know there's people who can't do that. They're like, no, how can you say that? We can't do the righteousness of Jesus. We can't do it by our own. But because of the blood of Jesus, we can come before the Lord boldly and confidently because his blood has cleansed us from all our sins. So you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be ashamed to go to church. You don't have to be ashamed to serve God. He loves you. 
and he will change you. And he wants you and I to come boldly before him. Remember what I said, he's not looking for righteous people. He came for the unrighteous. He came for the sinners. And that represents you and I. The hardest thing one could ever experience and go through is to be crucified on the cross. Because this was the most loneliness, the most difficult time of Jesus on, on his time on earth to be crucified on that cross. Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place of the death, that's where Jesus was. And he was on that cross saying, carrying the sins of the whole world. He carried your sins and my sins, all the things that we've done, so that we can be forgiven, so that we can stand before God and not be ashamed. Jesus was willing to go through the pain, and especially that loneliness, that loneliness, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt that very lonely, that he was alone because he was carrying the sins of the world. And it was said by many scholars, it's because at that moment, God couldn't look at sin. And he was carrying the sin of the world at that moment. Jesus felt the loneliness that you experience, even much more, a billion times more than the loneliness that you experience. So he knows what you've gone through. He knows the loneliness that you experience. God was so lonely at that moment, but he knew like, yes, I'm going to withstand this. I'm going to keep going because I know I will eventually be with my children. I will eventually be with you, my children if I were to go through this season of loneliness. As they were going out, they met a man from Simon named Simon. And they forced him to carry the cross. They came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Yet the Lord was willing to crush him, causing him to suffer. If he would give himself as a guilt offering, an atonement for sin, he shall see his spiritual offspring, he shall prolong his days. You see that? What gave him hope through that time of severe loneliness is I get to be with my children. I get to be with my offspring. I get to see these millions of people coming to the kingdom of God. He was willing to be crushed, to suffer, to go through so much injustice so that you and I can be in heaven where there's no more death, no more suffering, no more evil, no more pain. It's the best place ever, amen? And I know there's some people like, no, I don't want to die yet, but I'm here to let you know that death is not the end for us. And actually, life is much better than death, amen? It's going to be better than our life here. And, and, and that's why it's, I was so encouraged by the, the earlier Christians. When someone dies, they would celebrate and have a, you know, celebration that, yes, they have gone into a better place. You know, not like the funerals we have here. I understand. But it also makes sense for us who are believers that we know that their life, we should celebrate it. Amen? It's not a waste, whether they're young or old. They make a huge difference in this world one way or another. And it says in John 10, 28 to 29, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. Amen? And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Praise God. Amen? Amen. No one can snatch you out of the hand of God. That's what I love about this security that we have in Christ. So you don't have to be wondering, am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I saved? You are secured in Christ once you believe in Him. Amen? Amen. You are secured. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to to snatch them out of my Father's hand. No one can snatch you out of God's hand. Jesus went to the place of death so that we can go to our new home in heaven. Amen? Amen. Jesus went to the place of death so that we can go to our new home in heaven. That's the blessing and the hope that we have in Christ. And here we see Jesus. He tried to put a sponge of vinegar in his mouth. Look what it says here. Later knowing that everything had now been finished, so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. In 
And John 7, 38, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Amen? We have, we're, we are not a dead church. We are a live church. Amen? Amen. And that's the, the beauty is that we have the living God living inside of us through his spirit. And that's so important that for us to understand that in this world, you will be empty. In this world, you will be dry. But when you find Jesus, there's an overflowing presence that he wants to give you and I. There's people out there who have millions of dollars, yet they don't have joy. Yet they don't have peace because I tell you, you cannot buy it. You can't purchase it. It's only something that God gives us through his spirit. Amen? So I know, I know in my spirit, I feel that some of you have been dry. You've been dry because you're trying to find that fulfillment, trying to find, you know, in the world. You will never find it. It's only Jesus who can fulfill that void in your heart. It says in scripture, we're made by God for God. So if you don't know Jesus, you're never going to find fulfillment or know who you are. But it's only in that relationship with Jesus that you find that inner peace, that inner joy that no one can take away. Amen? That's why when people look at you, they're not going to see a sad person, even though you're going through hardships. They're going to see you full of the peace of God and full of the joy of God. Amen? So when things get rough, you and I can have that joy. You and I can have that peace because Jesus through his spirit gives us that. Jesus was thirsty so that we can be filled with the overflowing presence of God. I tell you, nothing, I'll never forget when I was in the retreat, you know, 2000, it was year 2000, that I encountered God, God over there, where his presence just really filled me and made me understand what the gospel is all about. He gave me this understanding and also this experience that I love you, my child. And I'll never forget that encounter I have with the Lord. And my prayer is that you will have that encounter. That you will be immersed in his love, immersed in his grace, immersed in his peace. The last point I want to share with us. We see here Jesus looking up. And the last word he says, it is finished. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he shall see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, shall justify the many, making them righteous, upright before God, in right standing with God. For he shall bear the responsibility for their sins. Amen? Jesus took full responsibility for their sins. He came to justify us through Christ so that we can be in right standing with God. I, I'm so happy that I'm a Christian because other religions, you have to work your way to heaven. You have to do certain things in order for God to accept and love you. The beauty is Jesus fulfilled it all for us. Amen? Amen. He fulfilled everything for us. It says it is finished. So you and I don't have to go to church because we're trying to pay back our sins. You and I don't need to serve, do things for God because we have so much guilt. No, you serve and you praise and you appreciate God because he has done all the work for you and me. Amen? And that's why you and I don't have to live in that place of wanting, of trying to earn God's grace, trying to earn forgiveness, trying to earn heaven. It's not something we earn. It's a gift that God gives us. Amen? And I praise God because that is the greatest gift. It says in Hebrews 9, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as a high priest enters the holy places every year with the blood of his own. You see, year after year in the past, before Jesus, they would have to keep offering these this blood offerings every year. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't even his own blood. It was the blood, blood of the Lamb. Then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared, what does it say? Once for all at the end of ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of his, himself. See, once for all. He did the sacrifice for us. As just as is appointed for man to die once, and after comes that judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin anymore, amen, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him, amen? So Jesus did it once for all. So you and I don't have to try to make sacrifices for our sins. Jesus paid it all. I always tell people this illustration. When a person buys you a car, it's paid in full. You shouldn't be making payments to the dealer. 
It's already paid in full. But there's so many Christians who are trying to pay back for their sins, but Jesus already paid it for it. Amen? It's been paid in full, so stop living in guilt and shame, trying to pay back for your sin. Jesus has forgiven you, and he has taken it all at the cross. Last is this. Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirements of God so that we can rest, trust, obey, and serve with love and adoration. We come to church and serve God for the purpose of love and appreciation. Not trying to earn God's love, not trying to earn blessings, not trying to pay back for the things we've done. But everything that we do is with the motive of love and appreciation for God's grace. Amen? So I want to take this time. Can everyone please bow their heads and close their eyes? And with every head bowed and every eyes closed, I want to take this moment for us to respond to what God has done this evening. And if it's you, I want you to kindly raise your hand, okay? When I mention this, as I read, and if it's you, I want you to raise your hand because I want to pray for you. If this is you, raise your hand. Lord, I need your help to deliver and release me from the chains of habitual sins, bad habits, addictions, depression, anger, low self-image, and hopelessness. If that's you, raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Raise your hand right where you are. I'm going to, I want to pray for you. Lord Jesus, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you meet your children right now, that you deliver and you release them, O oh Lord, from the chains of, hab of habitual sins, from addictions, O oh Lord. Release them, O oh Lord, from depression. Release them right now from anger. Release them right now from low self-image, O oh Lord, and even hopelessness, O oh Lord. May your spirit encounter them right now and release them. In Jesus' name. Put your head down, remaining head down and eyes closed. If this is you, raise your hand. Lord, I need your courage and power to forgive. There's people who have done me wrong, and I need your power in your Holy Spirit to empower me to forgive. If that's you, raise your hand right where you are. I'm going to pray for you. Holy Spirit, it's not easy for us to forgive, but I know, Lord, you called us to forgive, Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you give them the courage to forgive all those who have offended them, who have done them wrong. I pray, Jesus, that they will release them so that they can be free from anger, from bitterness, from hatred, from resentment, Lord. Release them and set them free. Give them the courage to forgive just as you were able to forgive them. In Jesus' name, amen. Remain eyes closed and head down. If this is you, raise your hand. Lord, I need your healing presence this evening to come upon my body. I'm, I'm going through some health issues, and but I believe that you're more than able to heal me. Raise your hand right where you are. And I want you to pray with me. I'm going to pray for you. Holy Spirit, I pray for your healing presence to come forth upon everyone who's dealing with any sickness or disease or any ailment or pain at this moment. In Jesus' name, by your stripes, they are healed. Say, I am healed by his stripes. In Jesus' name, amen. With every eyes closed, head bowed. If this is you, Lord, I need you to remove my guilt and shame. I've been carrying it for far too long, but Jesus, I know I need to move past it. If that's you, raise your hand. You may carry guilt and shame. I'm going to pray for you. Jesus, I pray that you give my brother and my sister the courage to move forward, to not carry the guilt and shame that has plagued them for many days or many weeks or many years. I pray, Jesus, that they would be reminded tonight that you came to remove their guilt and shame. That you came so that they could be released. So Jesus, I pray that they will no longer live in guilt or shame, but they will be free. You can put your hand, your hands down. Next one, if this is you, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I want to be filled with your presence. There's so many things in this world that has left me dry, broken and lost and empty. 
But Lord, I need your presence. I need a revelation of your love. I need to encounter your presence. If that's you, raise your hand. Jesus, I pray, Holy Spirit, that there will be an outpouring of your presence to fall upon my brother and sister right now. I pray, Holy Spirit, that they will encounter your love. The overflowing rivers of God shall come upon their beings right now, Jesus. I pray that they'll find their satisfaction in you, that they'll find their fulfillment and grace through you, O Lord. Fill them right now with your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. And last one, last but not least, if this is you, raise your hand. Lord, I want to receive your gift of salvation. I don't know where I'm going to go when I die, but I want to go to heaven. I'm not sure, but I want this gift because I know any moment I could die. And I'm here to let you know the best gift in life you could ever give or receive is the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And if that's you, can you raise your hand right where you are? And if you can, repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for all my sins. I receive your forgiveness. Remove my guilt and shame. Make me new. I believe that you rose again on the third day to give me new life and to take me to heaven. I surrender to you now as my Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, fill me with your peace. Holy Spirit, fill me with your joy. Holy Spirit, fill me with your healing. Holy Spirit, fill me with your presence. My life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Jesus, I just thank you, God, for this, this, this wonderful time that we, you were able to bring us back to the cross, the passion of Christ, Jesus. Thank you for all that you've done, how you displayed the greatest display of love and what it means through your life. I pray, Jesus, that we will be reminded and refueled to want to share this message to more people who need it, oh Lord. And also to be reminded ourselves how much Jesus loves us. And if you all could say this with me, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Lord, I know you want us to know that and to be reminded how much you love us. We love you, we praise you, Jesus. And we remember what you've done. And help us, God, and use us in any way to share to people of your amazing love. Bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. When I take communion, some of the things that I reflect on is kind of renewing my commitment to Jesus that I made a long time ago. It'll be 50 years. That at 17 years old, that I gave my heart to Jesus. I finally surrendered. It took a while. I was a resistor for about four years. I went to a church like this as a kid, not really being raised with anything about God or Jesus or anything. And uh, 
I listened, and I got it. Just what JB talked about as a kid, like 12 years old, even though I was kind of a knucklehead, I, I actually got the message. It's just I didn't want to commit my life because I was scared. And I didn't want to become some goody good kid, you know, and be teased in school. I mean, there were a lot of reasons. But finally, the Lord got a hold of me at 17, and I gave my heart to Jesus. So when I take communion, I think back to even the beginning in a church in a park with a bunch of hippie Christians. And we have these big loaves of bread. And big goblets. You talk about not being very sanitized. We share about 300 people in the same cups. And if you were in the back, you got a little bit of hairs and big right? You kind of have to turn the cup, you know, just so you weren't like, you know what I'm talking about. But we didn't care. We loved Jesus. We were sharing together. We knew what it was about. It meant something. Take the bread and the cup. Because I knew Jesus died for me and he rose again. And through the years, Jesus sustained me and loved me. And when I take communion, I guess I'm just telling him, and I'll just close with this. It's just like I'm telling him, I'm all in. I'm all in. Even in my brokenness. Even in times when I've been really down and had very difficult, dark times in my walk with Jesus, it kind of gets me back that I'm all in. I'm in, Lord. I'm willing to take the bread. I'm willing to take the cup. I'm willing to say, I'm married to you. Because really, we are. We're the body of Christ. We're the bride. We're one with Jesus. We're one with Jesus. So this bread and cup is kind of like our little bit of our pre-wedding celebration, right? He said he's going to drink it again when he comes back. We all celebrate the wedding feast. Well, this is just kind of like the appetizer. This is like a little warm-up. But we're in, right? We're in. Amen. We're in. So remember, remember that the bread is his body. As J.P. shared from the word, he was broken for us. He was broken so we could be healed. He was broken so we could be put together. And as hard as that is for God to do with all of his church, we are one in Jesus. We're one body. And his blood covers our sins. His life for us. So when we take the bread and the cup, we are saying, Lord, renew my love for you. Renew my commitment. I'm all in. I'm yours. Here I am. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take eat and do this in remembrance of me. Take the bread. His body broken so that you can be healed. Made whole. Bring peace. And he also took the cup and said, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is my life poured out for you. As you take the cup and drink, drink in remembrance that Jesus has given you his life by the Holy Spirit of God, by him coming into your life, by pouring in his life, and that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Jesus, we're all in. Till you come back, we're all in. We're all in this together. We're in the same boat. Just thank you, Lord. Thank you for the people in the body of Christ today that are in prison cells around the world that are taking the bread and the cup. People that are in homes, people that are out in the wilderness, people that are in buildings like this. 
Lord, your church throughout the world today is taking the bread and the cup. And Lord, we just pray your blessing over your people. Lord Jesus, until you come again, we are all in. Amen. Amen. Are you all in? Amen. And stand up and let's sing a closing song together. After uh, our service, we have some refreshments out on the courtyard. Feel free to hang out and greet people as you can socially distance. It'll all be safe, but we have a large courtyard. So feel free after we give a blessing at the end to stay in fellowship if you would like.
Jesus, we thank you for so much. We're so much filled with gratitude and adoration for all that you've done for us, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us, redeeming us, healing us, making us new, giving us hope, giving us peace and joy that only comes through you, Father. Thank you for exchanging everything so that we can have what we have today. You gave your very life so that we could be filled with forgiveness, with love, and peace and freedom that comes through you, Jesus. Thank you for your abundant grace and love. Keep us in awe, Father, all of all that you've done. May we never, may this message never go old. I pray that this message will remain fresh, filled with fire and love to want to share to the world. So Jesus, we come with gratitude and appreciation. Thank you for, for suffering and dying on the cross so we can have the freedom we have. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the highest price. God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all.